Well, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Steve Adler and I work for IBM and this is the fifth webinar on um, XSmile and System Dynamics and in this webinar we're going to explore big data in retail, taking the next steps with System Dynamics with a great speaker, my friend Bob Everline from IC Systems, who's going to take us through a really interesting use case in which we explore the relationship between big data analytics and system dynamics and the role that open standards in system dynamics like XSmile can play in helping uh, big data scientists and modelers take, make better use of systems thinking and ecosystems in analyzing data and developing strategies in retail. Um, one of the things that Bob and I and Kareem have been exploring for a few years now is the idea that we could take um, big data analytics around things like uh, price elasticity for products and explore not just uh, how to build a, a new strategy to win new customers and new markets with data analytics, but also to explore what the impact of our strategies might be on an ecosystem, on the sort of the tertiary consequences of our own policies on um, actors that we can't control on competitors, on business partners, on suppliers. And we thought that this would be a really interesting way of illustrating what we think is a symbiotic relationship between big data analytics and system dynamics and how big data scientists can take advantage of systems thinking to improve um, uh, predictive outcomes and strategies in how they work. We also sort of wanted to explore what would happen if we also were able to transform system dynamics models into more operational decision-making tools by making the values in stocks and flows um, related to real values in real data rather than inferred values. But I'm not going to get too deep into this presentation because, because Bob is a much better speaker on this topic than I am. And so at this point, I think I'd like to um, to turn the presentation over to Bob and um, introduce Bob Everline, my friend. Bob, will you like to take us through big data in retail? Great. Thank you so much for the introduction, Steve, and thank you all for attending today. So it's my pleasure to take you through an example of big data in retail using system dynamics to take the next step and go a little bit deeper. So the value and promise of big data is that it can unlock customer needs and show us things that are going on within our customer base that are not obviously observable. So it's fact-based decision-making. means that we know what works and who it works on. Um, and it also means that we can find out more and more of our, about our customers, especially as measurable activities are increasing day-to-day um, -day with um, all the different ways we have of measuring what's going on. System dynamics is all about the big picture, um, how changes propagate, how customers evolve, how suppliers respond to that, and how competitors adapt. So system dynamics, in a sense, brings it all together. And what we want to do is look at the marriage of system dynamics and big data and see uh, where the value can be brought by both of those. So to set the stage, I'm going to actually use an example here of a, um, a hypothetical um, store. Buy More is a large electronic store. Sales have been stagnant, and Large Mart, their competitor, has been gaining market share, so they're a little bit upset about that. But they've hired TLA, which is a big data consultancy. And TLA has gone through things, and they're pushing them with a, for a system that will help them target their customers better in their outreach. So this. Bob, who's a student of System Dynamics, has come in as a friend of Buy More and is hoping to add some insights around TLA's design for the people there. So the pitch that TLA is making to Buy More is that they can identify the customers responsive to the marketing efforts. So right now, Buy More is off and it's doing stuff, but it's like a bunch of arrows that are sort of flying in all directions. Some hit right, some don't hit right. And as a consequence, things aren't so great. Well. If we turn on our big data system, what do we have? We have straight flying arrows headed right for the exact customer we want to hit, and everything is going to be hunky-dory. That sounds pretty cool, and it really is. Um, if you can do that, that's a fantastic thing. 
But at the same time, we have to ask some questions about, you know, what's going to happen here. So the big data is going to be looking at predicting response based on demographics, location, time of year, product novelty. It's a list of things that you can have uh, that will have an impact on how you're going to be doing sales, but there's usually more than just a list. And System Dynamics is about stepping behind the curtain. It's about what causes that? Why do things change? So we go from lists to stocks, and I have a, a really simple model here I'm going to walk through for you. For those of you who are familiar with system dynamics, this will be quite trivial. For those of you who are not, hopefully this will be uh, somewhat informative. But a simple thought is that people don't just buy things. People buy things because they need them. And if people need things and buy things, the fact that they have bought something changes their needs. So I have a simple thing here, what I've called latent needs. And latent needs are something that are decreased when you purchase things, and they build up over time. And I haven't specified how they build up over time. I've just got them coming in actually at a constant rate. And if you have a model of consumer behavior that looks like this, what happens when you change the uh, promotion effect, which is shown in the diagram here, uh, and increase it is you do get an increase in instant response uh, in purchases, but that response um, dies out over time as the late needs are, uh, are, are taken away. And in fact, for this particular structure, eventually you go back to the same number of purchases that you started with because in the end, building needs is going to be the same value. It hasn't changed. All we've done is we've taken people out of the late needs more quickly. So that very simple idea suggests that just looking at lists of what is happening now and how they relate to consumer behavior now is not quite going to be enough. So response effects are going to change over time even when the inputs are not changing over time. Measurements are always made in what has happened. And in business and ultimately in many areas, we really want to know what will happen. And that's the big value that structure, what we call structure, brings to the problem. And structure is exactly this little diagram over on the right here that says, here's a relationship between the late needs and the actual consumer purchases that are being made. So that's what I mean when I say structure. Um, one of the so the buy more people think that's kind of an interesting observation, but the TLA crew um, are a little bit more skeptical. One of them thoughtfully says, you know, buy more has thousands of customers, and you just showed us like the picture of one customer. What does that have to do with anything? And my response, because I'm Bob, as you may have guessed, is that, yeah, it's different, but it's not that different. And the reason it's not that different is we can capture um, exactly the same thing at the individual level by putting in a little bit more detail. So this is pretty much the same structure that we looked at before. We still have latent needs and that's coming into purchases, except if you look at the individual level, a purchase isn't made continuously. It's, a, it's an event. You go into the store and you buy something. So there's a uh, stochastic process here, which means periodically you go in and buy things. And you can see that um, this particular um, Structure is the same. We have purchases. We have a promotion effect that had the same uh, value there. And this individual is coming in and purchasing things from time to time. So that obviously doesn't look a lot like what we saw before. But if you have a 1,000 of these people and add them up, what do you get? With a 1,000 customers, each purchasing periodically, you get pretty much the same pattern. You get a jump in promotions. You get a jump in sales. And that eventually decays over time. Now, of course, things are bumpy and moving around. They're not nice and smooth as they were before, but it's really the same idea. So we get pretty much the same dynamic effect by adding up a 1,000 customers as we had when we looked at a single customer. And the TLA people are saying, well, why did that work? Why do you think it's just a coincidence? But actually, it's a bit more than a coincidence. And the reason it's a bit more is that feedback structure, that fact that purchases change late needs and late needs in turn influence purchases means that you're going to see this kind of behavior no matter whether you have one, a million, or a million people. The individual model has more detail in it, um, but basically the same feedback structure is there and it's feedback structure that ultimately determines behavior. The behavior adds up and feedback insights almost always do add up. 
It's not always true the other way around. Sometimes there's uh, behavior that emerges from looking at individuals that's surprising at the aggregate level because the feedback is not at all obvious when you look at the aggregate level. In fact, it may be uh, covered up. But the other way around, if you see an insight um, at the aggregate level that's based on feedback, it's almost always going to be true when you look at adding up individuals. So is there anything we can use from this little example? The data scientists are now curious, and they are asking, and Bob has to smile. There are two approaches to using uh, this kind of insight in uh, looking at a big data problem. One would be to use the models offline. So we can fairly efficiently develop a model using system dynamics. That model has some insights, but it also has some mathematics behind it. And those mathematics can be translated for use in operational systems. Sometimes that's a bit tricky, but it's doable. For example, if you're looking at something like stock rotation, you might be able to develop a simple model of stock rotation for, say, a perishable good, um, figure out what's key and important in that, and then implement that stock rotation model in a uh, database uh, system or in a other um, progr programmatic system that can be used in big data. And the other approach is to incorporate models directly. That's something that's tough to do now, but that's really the promise of XMILE. Um, XMILE at the front end, um, here we're talking about a system of processing some raw data, bringing it in. Um, IBM is one of our partners here, so we're mentioning Infosphere, but it could be any system for uh, managing large quantities of data. SPS Modeler is a statistical system for looking at that data. And if we have an XMILE engine that can run in parallel with that, it can both take in large quantities of raw data and process them, and it can interact with the SPS Modeler in order to allow us to get analytic results from looking at individuals. Aggregate those up, and we can go off and make some decisions. So that would be a way to integrate with standard tools um, using a XMILE engine. Such an engine doesn't really exist at this point, um, and the XMILE standard, though, has the ability to make it so that people will be developing such engines and they could be integrated. So system dynamics, in that sense, could be used inside of big data. Um, if you think about it, big data uses lots of different kinds of statistical models. Logit and probit analysis are pretty common. So these discrete choice models are already there. And developing new discrete choice models are really constrained by the efficiency of design. And system dynamics can simplify that design process a lot. We work with conceptual models. It becomes much easier to think about what might happen. And then you can implement those. The models can be used directly, either hand-coded then, is the example I use for uh, perishables in a supply chain, or with an XMILE supporting an engine um, that would allow the computation to be basically plugged in and used with other uh, software that's commonly implemented in big data systems. But we really need to take a step back. Because system dynamics is uh, a helpful framework for conceptualizing microstructure. I believe that is certainly true. But system dynamics really shines when we start looking at the macro. And Bymore is interested in knowing what will happen when this new analytic engine that they're being sold is turned on. What are the customers going to do? What are the suppliers going to do? What are the competitors going to do? As Steve says, how is the ecosystem going to respond to the changes that they're making in their own strategy? Well, a straight arrow view, um, and just going back to the early diagram where all the arrows were aimed at the right customer, is that you've got some targeting, which is based on analytics. Um, you have some advertising spending, and your ads are either going to reach people who are responsive, or they're going to reach people who are unresponsive. If they reach responsive people, it's a big boon for sales. If they reach unresponsive people, well, it still helps with sales, but not so much. So if we can change who we're hitting, if we can take those arrows and make them straight, we're going to get a big boom, a big increase in sales, a jump in the way I've shown it here. And for large mart, there's not really any change. Uh, we're just getting more of our customers, and they're still doing business the same way. And a slightly more sophisticated model will show large, would show large mart losing some market share as we get some of their customers. But this, this simple one says we get a big boom, and it lasts. 
Well, I already went through this idea of latent needs. Let's refine the customer view just a bit more. Let's think about a refreshing, a dynamic refresh cycle where when you buy something, it, it does decrease your underlying needs. But, of course, those re needs can be recharged, and they can be recharged normally through just a normal process of rebuilding them. But you may be able to have ads and marketing campaigns that help people want to replace things faster. So you might have a new version of the iPhone every year or two that all of a sudden makes people want to upgrade and take over that, even though they have something that's working satisfactorily. So all of these kinds of things are a matter of pushing people out of the uh, people with needs that are net in, met into people who still have underlying un, unmet needs and need to buy something, because that's what we want ultimately, is people to buy our stuff. So we can change demand, um, and there's also a direct impact, obviously, of people who are looking to buy something. Our advertising is going to get to them and cause them to come to us and buy it from us. Customers respond. Well, we gain, but like in the case of the late needs, the gain diminishes. Unlike in the case of the late needs, the gain does not diminish as low as it went before because we've actually succeeded in cycling people through the system more quickly than they had before. The really interesting thing here is what's happening to the competitor? What's up at large mark? These guys should be getting hammered by us, and in fact, they're getting better sales. That is quite surprising. What's going on there? Well, we did a couple things to help large mark. First, when we quicken the refresh rate, we pick, take people out and decide to have them start looking at something new. They're not just going to look at us for the new things. They might actually go over to large mark and buy something from them. So as annoying as it is, our ads are actually helping large mark. But the more interesting thing that's happening here is that the large mark customers who, um, the unresponsive customers, the ones who didn't respond well to our ads, we're not even bothering to send them ads anymore. Large mark, not being as smart as we are, is still sending ads to everybody. And, you know, the unresponsive customers don't respond very strongly to the large mark ads. But they still respond a little bit. And so their market shares go up on what we call the unresponsive customers because they're getting uh, more coming out of their ads. We've effectively made those customers low-hanging fruit for large marts. We've just made it a lot easier for them to get those customers by ignoring them. And in addition to our competitors, what's happening with our suppliers? Well, our suppliers need to be ready if we're going to do this system and sell more stuff. And there's a supply chain that's involved. So we get some demand that comes in, and we'll get some shipments that go out. But in order to fulfill those shipments, the people in our supply chain have to order and produce stuff. And that means there will be a lot of work that's in process, as shown here. Eventually, they'll get the receipts, and they'll come into the ready stock, and we'll, we'll make a shipment. But in the meantime, we may not get everything we got. So here the blue curve is showing our sales. It goes way up. But then it comes down a lot, a lot more than it did in the previous one. And it um, moves back up then and, and cycles, oscillates a little bit. And red is showing the large mark um, sales. And you can see that when it comes, ours come way down, they get a little boost and theirs goes up a little bit more. So we've given our competitors a bump, and we've hurt our own sales because our supply chain wasn't ready or wasn't able to respond. That's the importance of the supply chain. So what does this all mean? Well, big data is undeniably a good thing. Um, in this example, actually, they have the same amount of spending on all of their ads, but they're getting way better sales as a result of that spending. So. That's a cool thing and, uh, and very valuable. But identifying the best customers is really only the first step. After we do something, things are going to start to evolve. Every time we make a change, there's a reaction to that change. And we can anticipate that evolution. I've given a first few steps here. I've shown a very uh, simple model and some of the responses that would be shown there. Um, this could be fleshed out to a more complete model that would have a more complete representation of both the competitors 
and the suppliers and possibly even the customers in terms of what they're going to do and how they're going to respond to things. So we can use that such systems to track ongoing changes. So the power of big data is not only to figure out what customers are up to, but it's to help implement new systems that integrate the data and the analytics. So everything can be used on an ongoing basis. Um, you turn it on, you've got something that's an ongoing source of insights. It's continually refined with the renewed data. That same implementation concept can certainly be done with system dynamics models. What stands in the way of that right now, more than anything, is the lack of a standard. How do you fit these things into the system? And so here's a little picture that suggests how you might integrate both of these things into a system. Um, when I say both these things, I mean the XML engine used in the analytic phase. Uh, we see that over there with SPS Modeler. But then when we aggregate the results and put them into a data warehouse or other storage mechanism, we could also use the XML engine to, uh, uh, that with more aggregated models like the one I've been showing in the last few minutes. And you can use that then to not only look at the models, but play with the models, explore the different kinds of outcomes you might see working with the models, and um, do use that as the input to decision management. So we see XMile um, enabling the development of engines that are really going to be able to work in these on uh, real-time and online systems that are being used operationally every day in order to let people explore outcomes of different kinds of decisions they might be making, different strategies they might want to employ, and use that in helping uh, them manage the decisions overall and improve their business performance. So a couple of observations are worth making on this. First, um, there are lots and lots of pretty standard components. I've shown a couple here, supply chains and market segmentation. Um, but there are a variety of other things that have been developed over the years uh, by people working system dynamics and those kinds of models. And they can be brought together as relatively uh, standardized pieces uh, if there's a standard format for uh, representing things. So XML has the promise of bringing together those standard components and allowing us to have them in a place where we can make use of them. The other observation is that the models I've shown are relatively simple. We're capturing aggregate relationships. Um, we're not using a lot of uh, incredible amounts of detail. We're focusing on feedback, action, and reaction, and that's what allows us to anticipate dynamics. So it's not a matter of developing systems that are so complicated that even the people developing them can't hope to understand them. Um, the purpose of a model is to simplify dramatically the real world so that you can understand things in the real world by playing with the, the model. And that's what system dynamics models are really good for. So XMile, which is going as the upcoming standard in system dynamics, is a uh, way of representing system dynamics models that will support, because of its standardization, integration with other tool sets and encourage more big data applications and more applications in other areas as well. Um, it also will allow models uh, to be incorporated into standard analytic tools and enterprise support software as engines are, wrote, are written that can make use of the XMile in order to have it be used in such systems. The XMile Technical Committee is a committee of the OASIS standards body. Uh, we're working on a specification that's based on an existing draft, expecting to publish it in the next year or so. Um, and we are very much looking for input. We would love to hear from industry and application specialists outside of system dynamics, as well as those who know system dynamics, about ways in which we might be able to make use of this, about areas of promise, and about things that might be obstacles to making use of it. And we'd also like to hear from technical people who are seeking to integrate system dynamics models in the work that they're doing. And um, certainly, if you're interested in being part of that technical committee, we'd love to have you on it. Um, you can find out more about the committee and the work that it's doing at the website that's shown on this slide. Um, thank you so much for your attention. I'd be happy to deal with some of the questions that hopefully have come up. Uh, during the presentation. Thank you, Bob. That was terrific. So we have some questions coming in right now. And this is Kareem Shashakli, by the way. We have some questions coming in. Um, if you have any questions, 
please feel free to type them into the questions area at the bottom of your panel for GoToMeeting, which is usually on the right side of your screen. Um, so the first question is, how do you see the role of system dynamics in counteracting the trend toward na naive pattern of analysis? Oh, toward naive pattern analysis and over-reliance on regression analysis with big data. So the um, over-reliance on regression analysis is because of the lack of uh, alternative tools that go a little bit beyond that. So obviously um, structure, which is one of the things I mentioned early in my talk, is a really important mechanism for understanding what the implications are going to be of uh, changes and influences on other things. Regression analysis is looking more at cor correlation than causation for the most part, and as a consequence, in many cases, uh, misses some of the underlying structure that might be causing the behavior. Um, I don't think uh, it's a lack of desire for people to get things right or anything like that. It's a lack of simple tools that allow them to look at dynamic things, and that is really why I think having XMILE as a standard and an analytic engine based around that at the front end would make things a lot more effective for a lot of people doing big data because it would allow them to look at dynamic systems instead of just static relationships in developing the, uh, the analysis of the large quantities of data. Thank you, Bob. Do you know uh, under what kind of license XMILE will be released? XMILE is an open standard, um, which means that it will be available for everyone to use, to use in whatever way they see fit with no patents or royalties uh, required for anyone. What language or syntax is needed to write XMILE models? So XMILE is a language that defines the syntax. It's an XML-based language in which we define uh, models uh, and the entities that exist within the models, so the uh, variables and the equations. And then it has a, uh, a syntax which is based uh, primarily on algebra, sort of an algebraic relationship syntax combined with the uh, stock and flow, which is a way of representing uh, differential equations or difference equations um, that is used in system dynamics. And the idea is to keep the simplicity of the system dynamics representation, but allow for the flexibility to incorporate a fairly uh, sophisticated set of tools. It also includes uh, the ability to define macros in a, uh, a way that allows you to do some amount of effectively programmatic uh, work within the language, although the focus really is on representations that capture dynamics in as simple a way as possible. XMILE also does include uh, diagrammatic information, the stock and flow structures that we've been looking at, so that you can see the visual representation in, as well as the analytical representation. Bob, are all of the so, uh, system dynamic software vendors are participating in the standard? So um, on the committee for XMILE, we have people from Ventana, from IC Systems, and from Forio. Um, the other vendors in the area, PowerSim and, um, and uh, the other one whose name I've forgotten at the moment, um, are interested in the standard but are not participating actively on the uh, standards committee. They're more interested in uh, the committee doing all the work and, uh, I, sorry, I say that as a member of the committee, um, and, and, and reaping the benefits of that, but all of them are interested in seeing the, uh, the output from the committee um, as quickly as possible. Um, do you see the issue of custom functions being non-transferable non across platforms? Um, there certainly will be uh, some issues with custom functions, and actually there are issues with not only custom functions, but functions built into different pieces of software that are going to present issues of transferability of some models. The hope with the, uh, the XMILE committee is to be able to capture 80% to 90% of the models in use today. And um, of the models that would make really good components uh, in analytic and operational systems, I think we can actually probably do better than that because uh, a lot of those models, as I say, fairly simple models can make a great deal of progress. And then specialized analytic uh, needs uh, could be 
addressed with an uh, XML engine that incorporates not only the basic XML, but whatever uh, added functionality is required by the software vendor. And uh, just to sort of elaborate on that a little bit, the XML engines could be written by different software vendors, um, in which case some extensions would only work within some engines if you needed to add a specialized application. But um, the broader uh, set of of models would actually function within all the engines. Great. Um, Steve, if you're there, here's a question for you. Are there any case studies or white papers of big data and system dynamics being used together? So, uh, we Steve has uh, apparently gone quiet, but to uh, answer the, uh, this is Bob, to answer that, uh, I don't know of any white papers that have been done on this to date, um, but we're certainly hoping to, uh, to get some out there uh, in the future. Um, I agree that system dynamics really shines at the macro level. Will XMile allow it to shine brighter, or is XMile mainly a mechanism to allow system dynamics to shine at the micro level? Oh, XMile, I think, will definitely allow it to shine brighter. And when I put up the diagram that showed the XMile engine in use in the two different places, when it's in use in an operational system, those are macro models. Those are models that are representing uh, the overall structure of an organization and the uh, ecosystem within, it, within which it survives. And as such, they are macro models. And I think that's the, uh, the biggest promise uh, in terms of a change in the way companies and other organizations behave that XMile can deliver on. I think changes at the macro level are huge. Um, I think in terms of uh, just data crunching and looking at different things. The micro stuff is really cool. Um, and these, once you have an engine, that engine probably used in more than one place. But I think the ultimate, ultimate promise of system dynamics and X, or let me phrase it this way, the ultimate promise of XML is exactly that of system dynamics. It's giving us the big picture. Um, when the standard is completed, Bob, and vendors have incorporated it, what has to happen before you can link it to other tools like SPSS? So once we have a standard, that means that there will be a format that um, a, a number of different vendors are using and reading, and those vendors or others in the area can take uh, that standard to develop engines that can be used to uh, link to things like SPSS. So it's not saying that there's no work to be done afterwards. What it's saying is that once the standard is developed, doing that work is using a common platform and we'll be able to build in each other's efforts. So the uh, tools that are used to connect it to SPSS um, could also be used connected to other um, kinds of analytic uh, systems and whatnot and it will become a much easier thing to, to hook up at a much broader uh, spectrum of activities. Bob, do you think that taking big data and aggregating it to use in a system dynamics model will result in losing one of the major values of big data, which is that it looks at individual level details? In other words, what does system dynamics gain from the big data opportunity? So it's definitely true that um, the big opportunity in big data is small, which is an odd thing to to say, but big data is allowing us to look at things at such a level of detail so quickly that we can find out stuff that we didn't see before. Um, some of those insights transfer up to the macro level. Some of those insights are really uh, very specific to the micro level. It's hard to make much of them, though it may be possible to make use of them in a uh, in the context of, of operational decision making at the company level. But Making use of system dynamics um, at the aggregate level allows us to take those insights and think about what the implications they have for our, what implications they have on the things that we are doing now. The structural insights that come from that aren't so much based on the data as what the data tells us about the way the system uh, 
interacts, or different parts of the system interact with one another. Uh, what is true, though, is that the state of the system, I'm getting a little technical here, but the position of the system, where we are in terms of the stocks, you know, what the values are, can definitely be informed by aggregation of big data. And having a better picture of where you stand right now at the aggregate level is actually extremely important for understanding what kind of decisions you need to make going forward. And so in that sense, the aggregation of big data up to the system dynamics uh, model at the, at the more aggregate level is a very, very valuable thing to be doing in real time or close to real time. I have two really quick questions that I'll answer. Um, asking whether conveyors and arrays are in X mile, and the answer to both is yes. Um, Bob, um, to the question of how to um, counter the over-reliance on regression methods as an analytic approach, um, I thought you mentioned that we need easier tools to analyze dynamics. What are you thinking? That. So system dynamics model building is an absolutely wonderful way to look at the dynamics of systems. But when it comes to getting in and developing models for data analytics, those tools are not easily applied. And so one of the both research areas and one of the areas that I think XMile has great promise for helping is to allow us to get dynamic model development inside of uh, sort of the standard regression kinds of software where you can develop models relatively simple, play with them a little bit, and then turn them over to the software to do something. So one of the merits, if you will, of regression models is you can just write out the model. You don't actually have to test it or anything before you throw it at the data and see what happens. Doing that with a system dynamics model tends to be kind of a fruitless exercise. Until you've developed a model that has relatively good dynamic characteristics, is robust, has units of measurement that match, has conservation of mass and all that kind of stuff, throwing it at a, uh, a regression or a statistical package isn't really going to gain you very much. So um, I think there's a step that needs to be taken in a lot of data analysis that yeah, right now is taken sort of on the blackboard and in people's minds and on pieces of paper. And they know that once they've written down an equation, they can just throw it and throw it at the uh, data and see what happens. And that uh, mindset needs to be changed a little bit to, well, let's kind of thoughtfully think through the format of that equation. Let's test it out under some different circumstances. And then let's, then let's throw it at the statistics and see what they tell us about it. Um, and system dynamics models are a good way of enabling that step um, for looking at dynamic issues. Um, great. Thank you, Bob. Um, using incoming data in real time to update previous knowledge about a system does sound exactly what is being done with Bayesian statistics. Will we see more Bayesian statistics support with big data and SD, and how fast is that going to happen? Uh, well, my estimate of how fast it's going to happen is based upon my previous estimate of how fast it's happened, and unfortunately kind of a lack of new data on it. Um, I think it will take a lot of time, but Bayesian statistics are definitely um, one of the things that when you talk about states and state transitions, you can think about that as a way of updating uh, something based upon uh, observations of the current thing along with a previous underlying model of how things look. And that's exactly Bayesian statistics. So I think um, as we, if we can integrate, as we integrate system dynamics models into operational systems and use the data that becomes available to update our understanding of those system dynamics models, we will be making more use of Bayesian statistics. Whether it comes under that name or it's simply this is the way things work with cool jello number 743 from our, our company, so it's just a sort of productized thing, I don't know. But effectively, yes, there will be an increase in the amount of Bayesian statistics. Uh, but it's going to take a long time before that's sort of formalized and recognized as the way it works. Bob, there are two unrelated questions about um, how they get more information about the uh, supply chain components you talked about or how they can find out more about uh, modeling and retail. Um, so I can refer, uh, this is kind of literature search stuff. If you want to, um, the system dynamics has a bibliography of, of work. There's been a lot done in, in supply chain. IC systems has a bunch of example models in, uh, in this area. You can also look at those. Um, so there's a variety of stuff that's out there. Um, 
and uh, in the follow-up email, why don't we see if we can't get you a, a list of resources that helps in that direction. Great. Thank you, Bob. There seem to be a lot of questions about whether or not there are uh, proof of concepts or working prototypes of integrating system dynamics with big data already out there. Um, there are not very many. Uh, there are. I do not know of many proofs of concepts. Some of this operational stuff, oddly enough, goes back a long way. So if you were to look at Stafford Beer's book, uh, Platform for Change, you will discover that in Chile in the 1970s, they were actually trying to integrate system dynamics models into the uh, uh, national planning process. Um, so it's, it's kind of interesting that that goes back so far. Um, most of the other work that's been done is proprietary. Um, and hasn't really shown up. The examples I know of, we didn't integrate models directly. What we integrated were the effectively the equations for models. Again, that work is proprietary. It hasn't been written up, unfortunately. Um, so there are, uh, but there are quite a few examples where the insights and equations that are developed for the system dynamics model um, are used in uh, in operational systems. Great, thank you, Bob. We're going to take one or two more questions here. There are a couple of questions here about how well um, XSmile allows you to uh, create hybrid simulations between um, system dynamics and agent-based or system dynamics and discrete event simulation. So XSmile, because it is a standard, just as it would allow integration with big data and other systems, will also allow integration with uh, different methodologies for developing models. So you'd be able to plug in uh, effectively, just like you would a software component, a, a system dynamics model into a larger frame and then make use of it that. So in, in that sense, it definitely enables uh, use with uh, other uh, modeling methodologies. Um, it becomes an easy thing to plug in either at the as a component, building up the met from methodology or as a uh, being fed as a uh, almost the same as the operational diagram I said I showed being used at the aggregate level um, both of those ways will work so you can take XMile and you could actually write an engine around it that would allow the XMile micro components to be combined into an XMile macro model um, here's another question is uh, where did the thinking behind XMile originate um, it's an interesting question I'll answer that um, this was originally proposed by uh, Jim Hines in the System Dynamics Newsletter, and it was later taken up um, by Vedette um, Diker at, a, um, at the conference, at the annual conference in 2005, I believe. And the information SIG started this, this effort to create a standard. That's where it all began. Um, there was one last question here that, that I was hoping we could, oh yeah, someone asked whether or not there's, there's an engine out there already that that deals with XMile? There is not an engine, although uh, at the, the XMile Technical Committee, um, Will um, Hussein has been talking about developing an engine that uh, might be made publicly available, and we at IC are also thinking of those lines, uh, making an engine that will be publicly available. So, so probably it's an open source project, but those are a little bit down the road right now. We need to get the standard done first. Right. The IC software, though, does both uh, all of our products read and write XMile as it stands today. Yeah, right. So I rephrase that. Right. The, we already do have engines that are out there running proprietary, um, and there are people talking about open source uh, engines that would allow people to make changes to the software fairly straightforward. Right. Which is an important point. <laughs> um, so we're ready to wrap up. I think if Steve, if you can, if we can hear you, that would be great. Um, Steve just had a final comment that, um, this is an old one, that XMile is published under a royalty-free license and unfortunately we've, we've lost his voice. Yes, we've lost his voice, but thank you for joining us for um, this webinar on uh, our fourth um, presentation. That's our fifth webinar, but our fourth presentation in this series. Um, our next presentation will be in two weeks on February 11th on Tuesday with um, Andy Ford, where he'll talk to us about energy market dynamics and look at two very exciting cases around um, 
how system dynamics transformed uh, parts of the industry. 